Welcome to the Leadership Blueprint Podcast, where we feature top designers and entrepreneurs and share their inspiring stories and leadership ideas. Now, let's get started with the show. Zach Waters here. I am the host of this show, the Leadership Blueprint Podcast, where we talk with top architects and engineers about design and leadership. I'm also the CEO and founder of Black Swan Risk Management, a professional liability insurance broker focused on helping architects and engineers. In today's episode, I wanted to share a great interview I did a little while back. I created this interview series uh, as a part of a bigger series for the Architectural Foundation of San Francisco, where I'm a board member. And the purpose of the interview was to share some advice that top architects had for young people who were interested in going into the design industry. So I really think you're going to enjoy it. And here's that interview. All right, John, thank you very much. We've got John Marks uh, from Form 4 Architecture uh, in San Francisco is willing to, to sit down with us and kind of share his time. Uh, John, thank you so much. Really appreciate you doing it. Um, oh, thanks if, for inviting me. Absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, if we just jump right in, can you tell us uh, just a little bit about yourself and, and your background and a little bit about your firm? Yeah, uh, so I was born in the Midwest. Uh, back in the late 50s uh, in, a very, in a small town, which was a university town. Uh, I went to the University of Illinois, uh, you know, state, state school, and then kind of escaped to San Francisco in 1981 and fell in love with the city and then never wanted to leave. Uh, so it's been an interesting journey. I've worked for a variety of different firms of different sizes. I've worked for big firms like HOK and KMD. I worked for small firms, uh, in Tiburon, which was uh, like Warren Callister. I worked on the peninsula, you know, so you kind of go around, uh, uh, probably the reality was every three or four years, I'd end up changing firms at the beginning. But then in uh, uh, 1999, we founded Form 4 and it's been 22 years, uh, 1998 actually, I believe. And it's been 22 years then in one place. And uh, you know, it's, it's been an adventure. It's, it's had its high points. It's had its low points. We've been through many uh, recession cycles and expansion cycles. And, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting dynamic. And so now I'm uh, the chief artistic officer, which is a little unusual title for an architecture firm. Right. Uh, but we're advocating for um, additional, or, or we're advocating for emotional meaning and, in architecture and to try to create buildings that people can love again. So we are a little critical of modernism to date and its disconnection to society. So from the standpoint of, of getting people interested in going into architecture, I think that more and more people are saying, we wanna make more lovable buildings. And so if, if one of the reasons you were unsure was you were unsure whether or not the profession was going to respond, I think that a lot of people are, are reaching out and saying, we need to do a better job. And uh, to get people to design from the heart, as well as from their mind, because it's both of those things in balance. Right, 100%. So that's kind of where we are. We, 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 we changed to a little bit of an advocacy position in the office, and we start our new vision statement with the term, uh, in order to return a sense of humanity to architecture, <laughs> So you can see where we're going. Yep. Um, anyway, so that's, I think, the background. Now we're about 40 people. Okay. Uh, the, the ghost of an office is in downtown San Francisco on 2nd and Mission. Uh, nobody's there. We're all working at home. Uh, and I think relatively happily working at home. There's a few people, maybe five or six, that would really like to get back to the office. But everybody else actually is voting to, like, let's keep this going or at least keep it flexible. Right. COVID gave us the opportunity to experiment with the notion of working at home, which we wouldn't dare have done. Otherwise, we'd, we'd be too worried that people wouldn't be effective and efficient. Right. Turns out, um, I know I'm working harder than I ever have. <laughs> right. That's, I'm hearing that across the board. And I think that was e even outside of design, right? That was kind of the fear was yeah. we understand that, you know, especially in the Bay Area where we've got cost of living issues and things like that to, to factor in, you know, the idea of having a team member that was away, it always, you know, I mean, we you know, talk about culture and things like that. Like, how do you build that? 
but also will they be effective and and uh, COVID kind well, of forced us. Hired, interestingly enough, we've hired, we have a fellow from Australia that's mm-hmm. working for the office now and a couple people that are working out of Mexico. Okay. Uh, and, you know, they, they don't want to move right now uh, to the Bay Area because things are, you know, up in the air and it's difficult to do a move during COVID. But they're employees now and uh, they're working away and they're very effective. That's awesome. The tools are great. I mean, 10 years ago, this would have been very difficult and 20 years ago, impossible. Mm-hmm. You know, you'd be, you'd be FedExing drawings. It would just be a nightmare, but right. it's actually pretty sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, you know, we are lucky in that sense, right. With the capabilities that we have to be able to kind of, like, I couldn't yeah. imagine, you know, 20 years ago being in a global pandemic, like, what would you do all day? <laughs> Just. Oh <laughs> yeah. No, it would, well, we'd hopefully all be writing poetry and. Right. We play, playing a lot of chess. I just watched Queen's Gambit on Netflix. So. Oh yeah, there you go. <laughs> I'd be playing a lot of chess on a chessboard. So. Um, yeah. Awesome. Could you tell me just a little bit about um, why you wanted to become an architect and maybe I, I'm, I hear a lot of there was there was a moment that I can point back to that oh, yeah. I, I knew I was you seven know. years old. OK, love it. I was seven years old. So it was one of those is it's un- unlike my daughter who did this with her career. You know, mine is a straight line. OK, um, but the thing was uh, before when I was six, before I I wanted to become an architect. I wanted to be an artist. You know, I wanted to be a painter. That, that was my real life goal, passion kind of a thing. And, um, but I grew up in the Midwest and there the notion of being an artist is not considered an acceptable kind of thing to do with your life. It's like, okay, well, you could do that on weekends, but you need a real job. <laughs> so I had this, it wasn't that my parents said that, but that, that it was the environment that I lived in. And, and when I was in school, whatever grade you were in when you were seven years old, they had a little thing on, you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, it's like a fireman, a doctor, this, that, and the other thing. And they were going through those things and saying, eh, eh, okay, I want to be an artist. And they, they didn't have artist in there. But um, what they did have was they had an engineer. And I was thinking, oh, this is kind of interesting. You kind of build things. I like to build things. I said, but it's not quite, uh, not quite there. And then they went to architect and they said, you could, you're, you're creative. You're, you're sort of like an artist. And I was like, yes. Don't. And I thought, okay, that's for me. So straight line. Now, I didn't really know really what it meant other than you design buildings, you do, you know, buildings. Uh, it wasn't until I actually went to college that I truly understood. They didn't have programs like this. <laughs> they had drafting in high school, which I didn't take, actually. I took art classes. I didn't take the drafting classes. But, um, but I, then I did discover later what it really meant to be an architect. And then I knew that, that it was a good combination of my skills. My, my father was an economics professor, so I always had a science and math comfort, but I was also an artist. You know, I've always painted all my life and wrote poetry and things like that. So I now it. I get paid to story. I love it. That's <laughs> a great story. Um, is there anything particular about your job that you love the most or kind of what is your favorite thing of, of your day-to-day uh, uh, activity of being an architect? Well, the one thing to remember, it is a job. We have clients. It goes up and down. But I would say the broadest thing is, is for me, is that I can use my talents to make the world a better place. Mm-hmm. And, um, and that goes to you want to do the thing you love. And so, you know, I'm 62. I want to do this until I'm 92 or 102, we'll see. Now, health is always the thing that can stand in your way, but but it's the kind of thing is, you know, it's just something that I love. Right. Um, I'm fortunate because I get to be the artistic officer. So I get to, in theory, have the most fun, but it can also be the most challenging when you're making compromises which is the nature of architecture. It, it's a big, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of people, it's a lot of things, and you have to navigate that. And I used to tell people that as the design director, that was my job was navigating compromise. Right, But that's right. how you, things built. And, um, you know, that's just part of what you do. Right. So if you want to do the pure version, you have to just become a poet. 
<laughs> but, but the thing is, the trade-off is when, when, when it works, it's amazing. You know, right. when you build something, you've got all these hundreds of people that are all involved in it. And when you can actually create something wonderful, it is truly amazing. That's awesome. That's so you touched on a couple points there that I've just I've heard themes over and over again as we talk to people like you, which was um, the ability to kind of hit your stride in design in your 50s, 60s, set, right? I mean, this is an endeavor. Yeah. This is a long term play. Um, and it's not something, you know, it's, it's the exact opposite of being like a professional athlete where you have a finite oh, amount yeah. of time to make this work. You know, by the time you're in your 30s, you're 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 old and washed up right so yeah in architecture you have to um you can't do your midlife crisis until you're in your 50s you can't <laughs> decide am i successful or not it's in your 50s when you when you start to make that when you start to make that analysis um but i would say that for me um i i had a a bit of design autonomy after about eight years out of school but the first eight years, um, I had, you know, I might have been a designer at like KMD right out of school. I was a designer for three years, but then HOK, I did working drawings. And even though, you know, you know, I wanted to design and not do the working drawings, it, it's fundamentally was very important that I ended up doing that because getting that sense of how buildings go together and speaking the language and, and being able to, I joke around now with the people that are on the technical side that if I know that detail better than you do, that's a problem. But it's because I worked at HOK and did detailing and did, we used to do this thing where we'd, we'd go in and we'd find rat's nests, you know, places where the details weren't quite done well enough or they didn't work. And, and that was a fun job. It was like a little special operations group. And we'd go in and we just analyze this project and, and find things that could be done better. Right. You learn a lot that way. I'll bet. So it's interesting that you're saying that because I actually have a standing call right now with uh, Patrick McLeamy of HOK. Oh, yeah, Do you yeah, know Patrick? I HOK while he was right, there. Right. So he uh, he wrote this book, uh, oh, yeah, Design, yeah, Designing yeah. a World Class Architecture Firm. And, and he and I got connected. And he's saying some of the same things that you were saying in terms of the, the mission statement, right? Which is... Yeah. His mission now that he's retired is he's got a couple of different things going on. He wrote the book, but it's to kind of get design back into this place of, you know, not just being, not just following suit and, yeah. and, you know, kind of get the artistry back. Um, oh yeah. It's gone missing. It, it has. You yeah. Know, it's unfortunate because yeah. uh, uh, there's been a lot of disconnection. And recently there was uh, an article in Bloomberg about a, a survey that um, Harris Polls did and uh, for government buildings. And they showed people pictures of, of a classical, neoclassical building, a modern building. And only 27% of the time did people pick the modern building. Modern building. Mm. And this went across all race, gender, age, income, very consistent all across the whole thing is that people are not believing that modern buildings speak to them. Gotcha. And so we need to change that. And part of it is how we design and we need to design more from the heart and, and, right. and make it like we're artists again. Right. Yeah. I think, I mean, that's, you know, as we're talking about young designers, that's kind of I, a theme, uh, you know, the dream of a young designer is to leave their mark on the world, right. right. In some fashion on the sky, the, the skyline of a city or, or whatever that looks like. But most people don't grow up and say, I just, I want to design utilitarian <laughs> buildings that are... <laughs> well, it is, it is tricky because, um, especially these days, everything is, is, is moving to be much more and more and more co collaborative. So, so you'll be doing a part of that. And even as, you know, chief artistic officer, I do a part of that. And sometimes I do a little more and sometimes I do a little less. And, and it's a balancing act with giving people opportunity that are younger and... Um, you know, the other thing I would say in design, and this is probably really important, this is something that I've, I've always kept for myself in my heart. And part of it, I think, is because I, at heart, am a painter, is that um, I'm excited to have the opportunity to design. If it doesn't work out, like they don't pick my design or they do something else, 
but I still keep getting the opportunity, I'm happy. Mm. And, and every time the client, now that I, I'm you know, the chief designer, every time the client says, no, I don't like that, it doesn't bother me. And I say, ah, oh, I'm going to do better this next time. Mm. And that enthusiasm for like, I'm going to do better the next time. I'm going to you know, make it more interesting, more incredible. <clears throat> Having that endless energy and not getting disappointed because you had to compromise or because you had to do thing, this, that, or the other thing, you're going to always get another opportunity. You have to keep at it. You have to keep mm -hmm. your spirit going. Uh, and that's something that people kind of get frustrated with architecture sometimes because they, they, they get a no and they get another no and they get another no. Uh, so what we do sometimes is, is I tell the young designers, I want you to design something that you think I would like. And then something that you think the client, we think the client would like. And then once you get that done, you get to do whatever you want. Right. And, and, and we call that like scheme X. And mm. sometimes scheme X is the one that just out of freakish chance, the client loves. Really? That's awesome. It's usually the pure thought, the one that's got the heart and the passion in it. And people can see that now. Sometimes it's too crazy. So, so one of the most important things to learn is you need to balance your passion with a sense of reality in architecture. So if you're a pure or a fine artist, you, can't, you, can, you can afford to do that. But, but as an architect, everything is done in balance. It's not your money. You are not the person that's going to be using the project. You, you are using your talents in the service of others. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it be the client and the public, you know, or the people that are working there, or the people that are living in the house. And, and so you have to be sort of a steward, but you have to have vision at the same time. So the current dilemma is, is in architecture is to do the thing that Patrick was talking about, the thing that we'd like to do mm -hmm. is design from the heart it has to be a combination of vision and collaboration together. Mm -hmm. So in the old days, the Frank Lloyd Wright days, it was all about vision only, the mm -hmm. heroic, you know, at that time, it's the heroic male architect. And now we're transitioning, but we still need to, still need to learn to balance. Because, right. you know, the collaborative setting, it can, be a, it can get a little mushy and it can get a little average. And you got to be able to push it. You know, you got to be able to get the vision in there. Right. And people have that in parts, but you know, it's just, it's an adventure. It's a really important point because whenever we think about collaboration, I mean, that's always, it sounds like a really good thing. And oftentimes it is right. But when, when you throw, you know, too many, too many cooks in the kitchen for lack of a better term, I mean, you can. Uh, well, that was the lose. concept of the Frankenstein yeah. monster, right? right? Like it's right. all different pieces and then everybody's happy because they got their bit and piece, but nothing works together. But yeah, exactly, exactly. But, but the thing is, all kinds of interesting ideas percolate up out of having, you know, more voices on the project, but you need, still need the vision, right? And so that's, I think, what the profession is going to have to wrestle with is, is, so you went from the heroic era to the collaborative era to what I would call the balanced era. And right. we're not quite in the balanced era yet, but I think that's the future is how do you do these, how do you do vision and collaboration at the same time? Right, right, got it, okay. Um, if we were pivoting away from kind of yeah. the, your favorite part into just like one of the hardest parts, uh, maybe on a day-to-day -day or, or of your journey, uh, you know, through architecture, uh, what comes to mind when you say something like that? Oh, uh, yeah. So, so in architecture, the, the hardest part of the journey is almost always the clients. <laughs> uh, um, in the sense that, um, you know, you're, again, you're navigating compromise, you know, you have a dream, they have a dream. And, and, you know, sometimes you can, you can have some great disappointments there. Mm -hmm. And, and then also, you know, in the process of construction and, um, you know, there's, there, there are things that happen. So you have to be nimble. Right. So you go from ups and downs. And, and so those are the things that are the hardest parts of it. Right. Again, you just have to build your own internal resiliency. Right. So you just come back at it because you know, it's a journey and it's, it's not going to change. You're not going right. to suddenly have perfect clients. There is no such thing. <laughs> right. 
Because clients that have endless amounts of money usually have endless amounts of opinions. <laughs> That's interesting how that works. Yeah. Uh, I have a lot of uh, sole proprietor uh, architects and, and they design custom homes all over the Bay Area for you know the, the doctors and lawyers of the world. And that can be an amazing uh, job, right? I mean, you get a chance to express your creativity, but also with, with lots well, of money so, comes. Well, so yes, yeah, so, so he, that's a good point. One of my favorite aspects, and I think in residential, this comes uh, to the forefront even more uh, profoundly is that um, someone that wants a house designed for them, it's for them. I mean, it's literally for them, right? And so they feel very entitled, which they should be, mm -hmm. that it should be about them, right? And not necessarily only about the architect. Now, now some clients say, okay, you know, and they might, if they believe in fine art, they would say, okay, I'm gonna find the architect and, and I'm gonna pick that style because I know the style that the architect likes, you know, that does. Uh, so like if Frank Gehry or somebody like that, they're, they know what they're gonna get and that's what they want. And then they have a certain dynamic relationship with that person. But for most people, it, it's not that, they don't have that reputation of being this kind of star architect that the client is coming to you for exactly what you love to design yourself. So. So what happens is you're in a dynamic with them, and especially in a house, what you need to do, and I think is when we do this well, this is what we really do, is you need to listen really carefully to what their dream is. But if, if you only parrot it back and do what they ask, just exactly what they ask, which is what a lot of architects do, you've done them a great disservice. Mm -hmm. Because what you need to do is to be able to give them something that is their dream, that they can feel and see themselves, but it is so much better than what they could do on their own. It's, that's the part, that so much better part is what we should be doing. And that involves that, again, vision and collaboration. So you got to listen, you really has to be about the client, but it doesn't mean that even stylistically, it can't be about you, but it, it's, you've got to blend it and they've got to, you know, just ideally they're in tears, right? That's, that's the ideal thing is the client's like, this is so great, but it's something they couldn't do on their own. Right. Because if you imagine music, I know a lot of people that, that play music and some of them write music, not too many, but some write music. But in general, the people they love are over here. You know, it's like, you know, WC. And, and, and Brahms and all these people, they're never gonna be that good, but they can dream at a higher level. That's our job is to, is to get our clients dream up to a higher level. That's awesome. Anyway, that's that's so, really powerful actually. And I think that's super important, kind of back to the theme uh, of the, the mission statement, which is you know, this, this, this collaboration, but also you've got to push people, right? If you ask me what I want and then, you know, I tell you, and then you just create that, it's like, well, that, did we do our job, right? Did it well, I, truly did it? It gets to a level, right? right, and right. It's okay. There's yeah. nothing, a client will be happy. So right. the issue is how do you push them? And, and, but, but, but when you push them, it's not pushing them into something they don't want. You need to really do listen. And, and our job is to make it so much nicer than what they could have done by themselves. Right. right. That Delta is our job. Right. I love it. Can do, the contractor can do this job. Right. The gets it up to something really sweet. And you have to develop personal relationships. It's very important because um, you have to build trust. If the client never trusts you, it's always going to be like this adversarial thing. And, uh, and some clients are very trusting and some it's difficult. You have to be like with a house, you almost have to be a marriage counselor, right? Because mm -hmm. you're going to get the husband and wife or, or who, the, the two married partners doing this, right? Like going in opposite directions. Yep. And marriages have broken up over building houses. Oh, man. They have. No, I actually yeah. worked, sadly. I mean, not sadly, but I weirdly, I worked, when I worked for Warren Callister, um, it was husband and wife. And the designer, um, you know, was trying to navigate the thing. And it ended up that they got divorced and the woman married the, the architect. <laughs> Not the house. <laughs> yeah. get the money. The rest of the money. 
<laughs> oh just, man, yeah. Because it's a very intimate, you know, relationship that you it is with people. And um, anyway, it is. No, that's that's uh, that's a great point. Um, this is an interesting one because because you open your own practice. Yeah. One of the things I'm hearing a lot is this generation of designer and and maybe broad if we get out of design isn't striving as much for an ownership role or a leadership role and and yeah, so when i is that is that okay yeah so i'm hearing oh, yeah. uh, no we have that huge problem we talk about this all the time so, right. so there's so there were originally four of us you know in the in the evolution and and what we what we realized after a little bit in time is uh, that one of the things that differentiated the four of us was one we were hungry mm -hmm. for something. Now we wanted different things. Like I wanted design, I wanted art. Uh, some of my other partners wanted to make a lot of money, <laughs> and and some of them just wanted to to you know live and breathe the profession the way they they feel you know technically they wanted to do. But we all were hungry, you know, we wanted this thing and we all had a lot of initiative. So we would push and pull and make things happen. And the problem is um, with a lot of the kids is they just want to be part of a team and they just want to be part of a team. And they feel alone and isolated. If like if I have one of them come work with me. They feel alone and isolated, like where's the rest of the team? And they, 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 they almost don't know how to, like if I say, just give me 20 ideas. And they're like, well, how do I do that? <laughs> I mean, it's just like, you know, it's, they want the team, they want the group to come up with 20 ideas and they'll, they'll add to that, but it's in a group setting, right? They feel more comfortable. Right. It's a very interesting dynamic. The downside of that is you're going to get less artistry right. and you're going to get more of a sense of of these bigger firms the corporate firm and and we're in the in-between um we did a book called the absurdity of beauty rebalancing the modernist narrative with the architectural review and and i sent it to a friend of mine who who used to work at gensler and his first response was oh yeah you hate all these big corporate firms and i said i said actually we're very much the same as you are. We're just saying we can do a better job. Uh, but one of the problems is, is in a sense, sometimes the bigger firms, they don't give voice to individual people. It's, it's like a group dynamic. You, you hire a big name corporate firm, um, of which there are many in San Francisco, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and they, um, the, the, firm's, the firm's brand is very generic. And so, so the question is, and I'm hopeful that, that, that these corporate firms can, can and will morph into being more creative uh, um, institutions. And that's why, you know, with, with Patrick McLaney saying uh, somewhat the same thing, like you were saying, that gives me hope that, that we'll be able to reintroduce that into those firms right but it also is going to take people that are young being hungry to want to design to want to speak from their heart and uh and hopefully um you know push a bit right then that's something so you know when i think about the foundation and kind of what we can affect and granted this would take you know, this is a study that would take years to see if we're right or not when I'm talking to designers that own their own firms 20, 30, 40 years ago, when, when they were in school, uh, whether at undergrad or graduate school, they felt as though their professors spoke to them in a way that was like, eventually you will be an owner, right? And part of being a great leader is, is being a great follower in the beginning, right? You can't, you're not a leader right out of the gate necessarily, or at least not, not at the level of ownership. Um, but it was, it was this expectation. And you know, and what I do with, with risk management, I mean, we teach a little bit of Cal and I know you were, you had taught some classes at UC Berkeley, right? Yeah. 12 years. Yeah. 12 years. And now, you know, when you're in architecture classes and, and you ask the students to raise their hand, are you even, are you looking to be licensed, right? The percentage over the years is dropping in terms of people that actually. Yeah, you don't, you don't need licensure. to be licensed to be a, a, 
basically an architect, a designer for right. your entire career because only one person needs to sign the drawings. Right. And, right. And you don't you don't get more money. Right. You the race. <laughs> However, at the very top, it does limit you because the the top, the top tier of an architecture firm, you want people to be licensed architects so that you can go to the client and say, oh, but I'm an architect. Because if you're not licensed, you can't really say that you're an architect. You shouldn't not, say that it's, you're it's not legal in the state of California to say you're an architect. Not if legal. You're not, yeah, no, right, not. right. Yeah, I mean, so. It, you're, you're effectively an architect, but, but you have to. So weirdly, you know, we've got the title project manager and then right below project manager is project architect. Mm -hmm. But if someone's not licensed, they can't use that title. Right, right. Yeah. That's a that's an interesting problem that I would love to figure out a really long term solution to from a training standpoint in, in terms of leadership training right because leaders leadership is incredibly important right leadership uh, will alter the path both good and bad of a firm um, and I'm wondering wondering what we can do to get well younger... leadership is an interesting thing because um, uh, you know we work with a lot of Silicon Valley companies. Um, I mean, Google, Facebook, VMware, Netflix, I mean, just all, all over the gamut. And they have what, you know, you call like a Silicon Valley collaboration model that we're trying to design space to support. And, um, but the thing I found is that the model they use um, doesn't work that well for architecture and interior design. Hmm. So, so the thing is, as, as you're, you're developing leadership courses in a focus, it depends on what you're doing. So, so what works in Silicon Valley to create software programs and develop, you know, concepts for products is very different than, than what's going to make a building speak to your heart. Mm. One way to look at that is that, that Google is extraordinarily good at telling you quantitatively why something is popular but it cannot tell you if it's any good, mm. right? It cannot tell you qualitatively whether it's good. There are judgment calls, again, that have to come from the heart artistically. And it's very difficult. It's, it's, the management model is not set up necessarily for an artistic process mm -hmm. because it tends to be more linear, logical, verbal. And, and architecture and, and design is a balance between linear, logical, verbal, and non-linear, intuitive, and visual. Mm. And that's a creative process versus a thought process. And so to manage artists, to manage creative people, you have to modify that management skill set, right? Right. Because it doesn't quite work uh, as cleanly, you know, in terms of transference, right? So, so what's fascinating is if you can get it to work, especially for architects, Right and and designers, interior designers, right. and landscape architects and, and landscape urban architects, designers. yeah, all design. Right. So so our firm name is Form for Architecture, and we're we're tempted to change it because it sounds now so singular, and half the office is interior design. So, um, who knows? We might change. Yeah, it. Form interesting. Form. Going through a rebrand. Well, we are doing a rebrand. Uh, are you okay? Oh yeah. Well, one of the partners left. Uh, one of the, the original four, mm. and uh, and so now we're back to sort of three three and a half. We have a, a one fellow that's uh, um, on his path to becoming a, a shareholder, mm. and um, and so we thought we'd take that moment after twenty years of read looking. So we have now Form Four Two Point mm. That's the one that starts with. Um, in order to return a sense of humanity to architecture or to design, so again, you know, get rid of just the architecture word, to design, uh, you know, we advocate for blankety blank, blank, blank. Right. So, um, but the important part is that returning a sense of humanity to design. And that's what differentiates is we wanna make those lovable buildings, again, designed from the heart. So. Uh, that's great. Okay. Um, the projects question, this is a tough one because we don't want to ask you like what your favorite project is because hopefully it's all of them or close to all of them. 
But is there a project? Oh no, I wrote that? down a couple because you did you, you had okay? Post, right? All right, perfect. So, um, so there's two, you know, just to narrow it down. Um, so one's built and one's unbuilt, and I think that for me is very important. And par partially, this again, it comes back to being a painter. Is is I generally generally love the unbuilt projects better than the built ones. Uh, mostly because the un some of the unbuilt ones were design competitions where you can you can design freely, you know you can get your cadence going and and really you know, stretch your design muscles and you can't mm -hmm. do that generally with with clients on you know two hundred million dollar projects that they they're going to be a little conservative about. Right. But every once in a while you get a great one which is uh, Innovation Curve which is in Palo Alto on the near the corner of Hanover and Page Mill. And this is a very lyrical building, but it's also very green. It's, it's lead platinum. It's very close to being net zero uh, building. Uh, and um, I think it's uh, playful, it's lyrical, it's still, it's very thoughtful, it's, it's very dynamic, and it's very unusual for Silicon Valley. Right. Um, so that's on the built side, that would be my favorite one. And then there on the unbuilt side is a design competition that's called Sanguine Lily. And, uh, you know, so in the, um, in sort of the uh, uh, tradition of James Abbott M Neil Whistler, who painted Whistler's mother, uh, we have lyrical names for many of our projects. So Sanguine Lily uh, is a project that was designed in the shape of a lily flower. And it's a, it's a chapel in, a, in the Glasnevin Cemetery in Dublin. And it's there to honor the 232 souls that were um, killed in the Easter Rising in Dublin in 1916. Oh. So the chapel is right next to the mass grave that the English buried all these folks in. Wow. And, and so it has many. So, so when I look at things, you know, there's like the emotional meaning of a project. And, and so for us, it's. It's not that buildings need to be beautiful per se, but they need to have strong emotional meaning. So the lily is very beautiful, but at the same time, it's sad in a way, right? Because right. it's commemorating a big tragedy. I mean, a, a horrible tragedy, right? Um, but it also was a bit of the future. I mean, the, the, still a difficult future in Ireland. right? Um, but anyway, it, it, it's, it's both beautiful, it's meaningful, it's got a lot of symbolism in it that's very powerful. Um, inside of the chapel, if you imagine, it's, it's got glass walls on, on two sides and there's sort of like this lily flower, very thin concrete kind of tensile suspended roof. And um, at night, what you see are these 232 glass spheres that are lit up. And at night, they represent the souls ascending to heaven. Mm. Wow. So, you know, you that's, can do yeah. poetry. Yes, you can do poetry. That's awesome. So that's, that's why really I like cool. that one. Yep. You know, is the ones. We've got some other fun ones, you know, ones called um, uh, Crashing Waves and uh, Luminous Moongate and uh, uh, Lyrical Seashore, Sea Song. You know, there's a whole bunch of, of, right. of different projects that are are quite I'm quite fond of but i think uh sanguine lily probably is the one that pulls it all together the best right that's awesome that's really cool um okay just a couple more questions for you here and we'll let you go um are there any leaders in architecture in design uh that you admire or have inspired you in in some manner Oh yeah, I have a, a lot. Um, you know, again, it's it's hard to narrow it down. It isn't like there's just this one, right? Um, and uh, so, you know, I kind of thought about it a little bit, and uh, I have three because okay. uh, you asked for three. Or you you said some leaders, but um, so Renzo Piano, uh, uh, Santiago Calatrava, and Warren Callister. So Warren Callister, small little firm uh, in Tiburon. Uh -huh. And and thing that that uh, I think uh, exemplifies Warren Callister was that he was 75 years old before he got an architectural license. And the reason was he was very intentional about this. And and actually, 
he, he didn't get it voluntarily. Uh, his um, daughter-in-law, I think, um, decided to do this as a birthday gift. And she actually went and lobbied George Duke Majin, who was governor at the time, and said, Warren deserves an architectural license. He'll never apply for it on his own, but he's been doing architecture for you know, 40 years. He's done all these amazing houses and churches and all of these wonderful buildings. Um, and can we make this happen? And, and they, they actually made this happen. And one day they came over and they said, dad, we're having this big party for your 75th birthday. And you're now a licensed architect. Now, I don't wow. know what about that because the reason he said, he said, architects are artists and you should never license artists. <laughs> Interesting. And, and when I went to work for him, that's the way he, he did his, his, his process. That's the way he, now there was always somebody that was a partner in the office that was licensed so they could sign drawings, right? right? So they got around the technicality, but I loved his passion for the idea of art and architecture. And he took it so far as to refuse to get licensed. Right. I've never heard anybody do that. Right. So yeah. that was charming. And he was very serious. He wasn't artist as in, you know, it's just going to do kind of crazy things. So there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, but he was very grounded. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so that's Warren Callister. And then Calatrava, just this beautiful lyrical structuralism mm -hmm. that's biomorphic. You know, it's kind of it's kind of based on nature. Um, you know, he gets in trouble all the time for, <laughs> you know, for these very expensive buildings. Right. Um, there is the Calatrava version of the Bilbao effect, which he designed a museum in, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, they, somebody else had designed a museum for the museum. I don't know who it was, but they were having trouble raising like $10 million. This was a long time ago, $10 million to, to build this thing. And they were almost going to give up. And then somebody said, well, let's hire a famous architect and see what happens. And the thing he designed was so beautiful because in Wisconsin, I'm from the Midwest, Wisconsin, people, you know, kind of notice if somebody's famous, but at the same time, we're like, eh, like, <laughs> you got to prove it. Like, yeah. it doesn't matter if he's famous, like, bring it. And so he designed this beautiful thing, right? This sort of bird-like structure that actually opens up when the weather's good and it closes down when it's windy kind of a thing. Mm. And, and it's amazing. And they raised... $50 million like that, because wow. people saw the dream, right? And the other group was just being too conservative to be too safe. Now, sometimes you have to do that. That's nothing wrong with that. But sometimes you need the dream, right? So when you get your opportunity to dream, you got to run with it. Right. But anyway, Calatrava also a painter, a poet, you know, sort of that whole package. Right. And then oh, Renzo it. Piano is just so thoughtful and sweet and kind. And, you know, there is this whole thing about the arrogance of an architect and we have earned that by being fussy. And I, and I actually worked on a project once as the client um, for a private club in the Presidio. And uh, I learned the arrogance of the designer because <laughs> I, I had to deal with the, the other architects right, right. Who, who the club had hired. And uh, uh, it was amazing. And they're nice people, but oh, oh my God, they were so difficult. But then I knew all their tricks. And so we got these big fights all the time <laughs> about things. Uh, anyway, but so it's nice to, to, uh, to have somebody so famous who's so thoughtful and kind. Right. And, and I think for me, the, the, the important concept in, in, in regards to that issue of arrogance is, is for people to understand the difference between self-indulgence and self-expression. And self-expression means you can listen, but there's a bit of yourself in what you're doing, right? That you're, 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 you're looking deep into yourself and you're looking into other folks and you can do this, but self-indulgence means that you could care a heck less about everybody else and you're just gonna do whatever you're gonna want to do. And sometimes that's okay too. But for me, the idea of being self-expressive and feeling the validity of that doesn't mean I'm self-indulgent, right? right? It doesn't mean that I don't care about anybody and I'm not gonna listen. Right, it's an important distinction.
Yeah. Oh, love it. All well, right. We, exclude, we tend to exclude self-expression from architecture. We do actually. It's like make it generic, make it so no one will hate it. <laughs> but when you make something so banal that no one will hate it, no one loves it either, right? And right. I'd rather do something that 95% that of the people absolutely love and 5% absolutely hate, then no one hates it. But nobody, nobody loves it. Loves it. It's right. Just zero. It's all right. Across the board. <laughs> all right. Last question for you. Um, what is the best piece of advice that you could give to an up and coming design professional? And maybe if you can go kind of two directions with it, maybe as you know, advice that you wish somebody had given you or something along those lines. And then also as an owner of a firm, um, as you're you know, hiring kind of the younger generation, if you have any thoughts there. Uh, well, there's a wide range of things that happen in architecture. Um, then, and when I was teaching, I know I'd ask the students, you know, if, whether people kind of told them what would happen because everybody wants to be a designer, tends to want to be a designer when they're in school, but only 10% of what architects do is design. I mean, really the creative part of design that everybody loves. And so it's tough and the other 90% are doing other things. And so, um, you, you have to you have to be balanced and embrace the whole process. And even as, so when I say that as chief artistic officer, I don't design all day long. Probably 25% of my day is design and the other 75% is doing all the other things. So, so everybody gets a chance you know, to do things, but it's not gonna be that like heroic, I'm gonna be the heroic architect. But anyway, that's not the advice yet. The advice is, cause I wrote a little thing down, is one is know your true self and know what your dreams are. And don't give up on those dreams, but at the same time, know what your talents are and both where, where you can go, but what your limitations are. Because not everybody is going to be good at every aspect of architecture. And some people are better at certain things than other things. Um, so, but you need to, and it takes a while to learn that. I mean, you don't know that when you get out of school generally. I mean, occasionally people do, but, but most of the time you have to go on a journey. And so you don't know where you're gonna end up in architecture, you know, right. within the profession of architecture and, and design. And then probably the most important thing for me is to, is to understand balance. And that, that what you're doing is always a balance equation. There's always trade-offs. There's always, you get this, and you give this up. And so sometimes people are too anxious. And this goes back to what we were talking about at the very beginning. They're too anxious. They don't have enough patience. Mm -hmm. And so for me, you know, I remember there was a fellow when I was working at KMD for the second time who was, who just had, he had this idea and he was going to sell this idea no matter what. And he was willing to risk, you know, his career at the office to sell this idea. And then I was saying, you know, I was saying, well, I've got like five ideas I like, and I'm, I, I haven't committed to one. He goes, well, you have to commit to one. I mean, it was just like, it's, there's no artistic integrity if you don't do that. And I said, I said, you know, I usually like to have five things and let's let other people choose, you know, which of those five, as long as they're all good. And so there was this dynamic between, no, you've got to have one idea and it's all or nothing or open it up. And, uh, for me, it's more balanced to do that. He thought it was horrible amount of compromise, but that's where how I got to where I am is the ability to know when to push and pull and to try to have five great ideas in case the one thing that you think is the great idea is total failure. Right. And then you're always disappointed, right? Right, so, right. Anyway, balance and patience. Balance and patience, I love it. Wait, that wait, was... balance, patience, and passion. Passion. Passion is an important one too. Passion. Oh, that was excellent. John, thank you so much for your time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Really, really appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Leadership Blueprint Podcast. We'll see you again next time and be sure to click subscribe to get future episodes.